Hi, I'm Kara, content creator and Facebook wrangler for Amico Brent, bringing you ideas and support for your creative adventures every day. This week's episode is brought to you by Amico Brent. Find your favorite Amico glaze at your local distributor. Happy glazing! Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration, featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit RosenfieldCollection.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 452 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm talking with Kurt Anderson. His work is filled with compositions of robots, animals, and human hybrids that are both visually playful and filled with humor. In our interview, we talk about the dynamics of color within his work, as well as trusting your aesthetic voice. To see examples of his work, you can follow him on Instagram at Kurt Anderson Pottery. Also wanted to thank Michael Klein for letting us borrow a microphone, which really helped in the recording of this interview, so a big thanks goes out to him. Before we get to this episode, I also wanted to tell you a little bit about what's going to be happening at Inseka this year. The conference will be hosting their first ever podcast room, which will feature six hour-long live tapings, including a taping of this podcast. So on March the 17th at 2.30 in room 212, I'm going to be interviewing Marianne Chenard, Julia Galloway, and Che Ochotli on taking an environmental approach to making. For more information, search podcasts at nsika.net. To start this episode, I'm going to have a short talk with Rebecca Harvey, who's the new director of the Archie Bray Foundation. The residency deadline for the Bray is coming up on February the 15th, and we talk a little bit about that program. So if you're interested in applying for that, you can find out more at archiebray.org slash residencies. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. So actually, I thought we'd start talking about how you got to the Bray, because you're our new executive, well, not, not so new, but newer executive director. So what, what is your path to being here? Yeah, I'm six months in now. So it's interesting. Um, I've had a long career in academia. I taught at Ohio State for 25 plus years, um, taught at the Royal College of Art, um, did a short stint at Ball State University as a director. So um, my trajectory at a certain point, I thought, because I've always been really interested in the making part and I've always really been interested in structure. And I think that comes with the kind of work that I like to make. I'm interested in like kind of the internal structures and how things either prevent or allow other things to happen. I think that's a giant glaze thing, right? You make things for the glaze to do. Um, so that's always been a great interest of mine. So as I went through like, you know, assistant associate full professor and then chair at Ohio state, um, I was trying to figure out a way to work and kind of marry the my interest in kind of structural things like in in the administrative world and then my own work. So at a certain point in academia when you get to a certain level you have to when you once you get to the dean level you pretty much make a commitment to give up your work because there's just not enough time. So I was looking at that and thinking that was my next step and then this uh popped up came in my inbox one day and I was like, oh my God, this could be the perfect thing. I could do the, I always joke, I joke here now. I said, it's like the perfect combination for me of um, 
like big motor and small motor skills. Like I can do the administrative stuff and the higher level stuff and also feel like I'm moving the ceramics field forward on a global scale, which is amazingly fun. And then I can get, go out and drive the snowplow. Like <laughs> there's no other place where I could do those two things. And I have a beautiful studio in the Shaner Center. So that, you know, I come in early every morning and work in the studio when I can scoot out at lunch hour, I do and come in after work. And it is... um to be able to do those two things and walk through the halls of the Shaner and talk to the residents, it's just so, like it has all the parts. Yeah, I've been really impressed with how you've been able to get to know all of us as staff members and also listen. Like I, I have been in administrative positions before, and sometimes it's really easy to come in and want to fix, 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 or mm -hmm. do things. And you've spent so much time listening. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. But how do you think as an administrator, the act of listening is helpful? I've had some really good mentors and I've had some really good, um, I guess you'd call them like negative mentors. You know, I've had some people <laughs> I've stayed over like, <clears throat> we had one pros that came in and he was just the decider. He would, he would just not really take in much information. He would just decide and there was no talk afterwards. And then I had a great provost who was, uh, he was a listener. He'd listen to people. He would take in their kind of thoughts and then he would kind of mull it over. He would make decisions, but then he would come back and explain why the decisions were made and would still listen. And that was, you have to have your team behind you. Like so much of it is team building. So unless you get everybody on board and all moving in the same direction, you can't, I mean, forcing people to do something is not the best way. So like everyone has to, and plus I'm a great believer it's funny when I started doing more and more committee work at, in, at the university level, people are like, Oh, committees, it's the worst way to try to get something done. And I loved committee work. I loved it when you come to the table with an idea and everyone else comes to the table with an idea. And then you leave the table with an idea that no one person would have thought of. Like it, I'm a big believer in the kind of the group thinking about things. Like there's that funny experiment where there's like a jar of jelly beans and it has a couple thousand jelly beans in it. And, and no one person's guess is correct. But if you get enough guesses in there, it comes, the average is correct. So that is the metaphor for the Archie Bray, right? There. Yeah. <laughs> Count the jelly beans. <laughs> we're, all, we're all guessing at how many jelly beans are in the ceramic jar. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, not one of us is correct, but all of us together come pretty damn close. Well, I feel like too the the nature of nonprofits is is that there's if we can think about boats, it's like a bunch of people on rowboats rowing in the same direction. Like there's often each department is kind of doing their own thing, and and hopefully we're all moving forward. And I think the same can be said of Ohio State, except that Ohio State was massive. I mean, as a university, I think I think it was one of the biggest in the nation while you were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it flips between I think Arizona, Florida, and Ohio State as far as largeness. And yeah, the, um, it's a ship that is really hard to turn. You know what I mean? You have to, to get all that stuff in line. So one of the things I've been really thrilled with here, like even in six months, we've made massive changes, like on an academic, academic scale would have taken us kind of years to get there. And now we're already there. So we're a great size. We're, you know, big enough to get stuff done and small enough to be nimble. And, and everyone, it's interesting, like to a person, everyone has been so willing to like hop on board and just be like, I'm like, I don't exactly know where we're going, but we're going to do this together. And I've had, there's been minimal resistance. Everybody's been like, yeah, let's do this together. So that's been amazing. Well, one of the things in terms of timing is that you've come in right as the pandemic is winding down, ho hopefully winding down. And the Bray, it functionally for years, the Bray was somewhat closed off in terms of the, their, the public was not going in to see the resident artists because it was just not safe in terms of interacting on a daily basis. But now they're starting to be events. You know, the Artist Amplified series is up and running. There's exhibi in-person exhibitions for the first, first time in a while. So can you talk about this idea of leading an organization into a literal reopening? Yeah, it's... um. I forget who said it, maybe it was Winston Churchill, like never waste a good crisis. Like there was <laughs> things that were learned in the pandemic about different ways of doing things. You know, we've really upped our, what we're doing digitally. The podcasts are part of that, um, kind of the online auctions and how do we kind of fold that in, but also how do we open up in a way that feels comfortable? We had a little bit of, I had a little bit of resistance from the residents when we started opening back up. They're just like, because I think, you know, my understanding is the studios were pretty much 
freewheeling 24 seven, you could come in. And then during COVID, I remember one of them, when I first got here, one of the signs says the studios are closed. And it's like, well, can we, can we shift that a little bit and, and do it? Like, let's start with open studios once a month. So instead of the sign saying the studios are closed, it says the studios are open and here's the days, right? So just kind of those things. And how do we kind of find a middle ground where we protect the work space for the residents and also Part of what, um, part of, I think for me, what makes the Archie Bray residency so interesting is it's, it's an exposure residency. You know, there's some residencies where you go out in the desert for a month and no one bothers you. They drop food off, you know, (laughs) this is like, this is about, we want to get the residents as much exposure and connection and contact as possible. So, um, Part of that has to do with, you know, in the Shainer during COVID, uh, people put up curtains and kind of block themselves off, which is interesting because I don't think a curtain protects you from COVID germs, but there, I think there was a feeling, right? Everyone's kind of like closed in. So it was great in the Shainer to just like clear out the hallways, take down the curtains, open that up and make it a really, just lighten up the space. And plus, I think it's really good for the residents to see what the other residents are making, like it fosters conversation. And That was a big part of my residency when I was there is being able to walk down the hall and see what Stuart Gare, I mean, I would talk to him every day and just peek my head in and see what he was making, you know? And I really got a lot out of that because he was working in a very different way than I do. And that's one of the benefits of the residency is it's not a potter's residency, you know, like there's sculptors, there's potters, installation folks. Um, I don't know if we have any video artists at the moment, but occasionally video people come through. So can you talk a little bit about the conceptual parameters of this residency in terms of what people are making? I think, you know, for the residents, really the conceptual parameters start with ceramics, but ceramics could be, uh, you know, it could be fired, it could be unfired. I always thought ceramics was really about change over time, right? It's about transformation of material. There's always, it's always doing something, right? It, it almost never stays in the same. Well, it'll be wet or it'll be dry, but there's always this kind of in-between time that you you do something with it. So it's just transformation. I think that there's a lot of, um, there's certainly a, a kind of push for experimentation. Like it's not a residency where you just come and make a giant body of work that you already know how to make. It's not a production residency. Um, it's about how do you extend the boundaries of the field? How do you extend your thinking? Like it's a experimentation residency. So I think that that's really important. Yeah. And the residency deadline, I mean, one of the reasons we're talking today is that the deadline for applications is coming up. That's going to be on February the 15th. So can you talk a little bit more about what the benefits are to the residents? Well, I mean, we have the the Shainer building, which is beautiful. We have beautiful high ceilings. It has a radiant heat floor, so that keeps the dust down. Beautiful views of the the mountains in the distance. So it's a semi-private studio. Like I said, no studios are private because it's really important that... um, that that open interaction takes place. I remember Julia Galloway telling me, you know, she was right across the aisle at one point from Rudy Audio and they just used to have great conversations back and forth the aisle. So I think that's really important, that kind of fermentation of ideas. Um, in addition to the studio space, so they're provided with, you get, I mean, it's pretty minimal that what's in the space, it's just a big open space and there's built-in shelves and there's a table or two. And and we have, if you need a wheel or something like that, we can find one of those for you, but it's just pretty much yours to do with as you wish. There's no requirements of what you make or how you make or when you make it's you know the studios are open 24 7 uh 365 days a year we have great um perry is our tech support he's amazing he can help he shows people how to use the kilns we we are known for we have a couple big kilns we have a big blau kiln and a big guile kiln that are in there and those are a lot of the residents use those. One of the jokes is people come in working small and then leave working big just because of the scale of which you can work. We have a a well-stocked glaze lab and we have a plaster area. So we have a lot of, um, plus the, all the assorted tools such as slab rollers, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty much everything you need in the education building, we have a fabrication lab has a 3d printer and a, and a laser cutter. So there's, um, those kind of facilities as well. So as the, applicants come in, they have to be selected. And the selection process in the past, I think has been, I don't know if it was, I don't think it's ever been intentionally hidden, but I don't think people realized for years that the resident director doesn't pick all the residents. (laughs) So can you talk a little bit about like the process of the committee that picks the residents? Yeah. And we've been talking about ways to just really make that more visible because it is a little bit, um, 
mysterious. And I always say, you know, in lack of a, when you have a lack of information, people just make up their own stories. And it's often not the story that you'd prefer <laughs> that it is also not often the true story. So there's um, the way the committee structure is currently, there's three people. So the resident director is always one of those people. Then there's the two other people. It's a two year term and they stagger on and off. Um, we try to, the committee is balanced. We try to balance, you know, kind of race, gender kinds of work because the people um, just to have the broadest view possible. Um, everything goes into slide room. We go through and rank the candidates. And then we have about a four hour discussion about who, uh, who might make a good choice. And it's not about, I, it's funny because a lot, a couple of people have contacted me and said, you know, when you look at my portfolio and tell me how to fix it, I'm like, I can't do that. I, I can just tell you, you know, put your best work forward in whatever way that is. There's no, it's very much about cohort building. So we pay a lot of attention to kind of the balance of the group. And also, is it a group that feels like this is going to be really exciting for them to work together? Because it is about that. It's not just about 10 different artists doing 10 different things. It's about 10 artists coming together and making a pretty strong cohort. You know, the it's one year with the with the opportunity with discussion with me to go for a second year. It seems mutually agreeable, but the potential is you'll be with these people for two solid years. So that cohort building that should last you, you know, that should last you 15, 20 years, maybe your whole life. We still have, we still have groups of people who talk, and they've you know they were at the braid twenty years ago together. So that's the other really important thing, especially as you move. You know, if you go to the traditional track and you've been through grad school, it's like, how do you, what do you do next? Or if you're in the non-traditional track and you're just working, like, how do you build a community? So we really are, want the um, the residents when they're here to build that cohort community that's going to last them. It's going to last them a long time. Yeah, and I feel like that that's kind of the soft skill part of being a resident is, is that you, if you come in as a resident open-minded – those friendships can last a long time. Like some of my best friends are the folks that were at the Bray when I was there in 2013. So it's interesting how I've come back in different times, but I keep adding to that friendship group <laughs> as I've come back. <laughs> and that's really important, but it does take a willingness to be open and it does take a willingness to be vulnerable. I mean, it's, it's, um, I get it. It's sometimes hard to see somebody look at something you're working on is just not going really well. Right. But I think it's really important, right. To be able to, I remember one of my teachers in undergrad said to me, you know, to be an artist, you have to have the thinnest skin possible because you have to, everything has to come in and you have to have the thickest skin possible because you have to be able to look at your work, right. And let other people look at your work. So I think that that's a super important skill to always cultivate. Well, that application again is on February 15th, due bef on February 15th or before. And where can they find the application? They can find it at archiebray.org online. So it's good. And like I said, it's just like your best work, however you want to present it. There's no, um, there's no one way. There's no right way. There's just show us what you show us what you want to show us and trust that that'll be the best. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate you doing this. No, oh, I appreciate you, Ben. Thank you. Well, I, I wanted to talk about the progression of your career and think about how you got to your aesthetic. You have a very specific aesthetic. And I want to know what the roots of it are pre-working in clay. Like w w when you were a kid, like what was the stuff you were attracted to aesthetically? I mean, that's a really fascinating question. Um, I was, I've always been attracted to weird stuff, you know. Um, and when, I, like, my mom had all these drawings when I was a kid that it was just, she would just give me paper and I would doodle on it. Like, she, I, I wouldn't even need to be watched. I would just draw. And um, there was, like, monsters and gigantic robots and, so yeah, I've always had this sort of a weird aesthetic and I've always been attracted to things that were like unrefined, I think. And, um, you know, the cruder aspects of, of society, I think. I was thinking as I was looking through work before this interview, like you, you're so good at figuring out a silhouette that has a sense of humor. So you'll have like a... Um, 
you know, like it'll be a body and then the hands will be straight up like a victory salute or something. Right, right, right. That makes it funny. Or there'll be a fish that has wings or something, you know, like you'll change a silhouette just slightly to give it more humor. How did you figure out that that was you? Because that, it's funny, it's not like you're drawing yourself, but those figures are so specific to you that I feel like in some way they do represent you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the way I write that. It's just trial and error, you know. I mean, I just probably made that gesture on a, on a drawing and realized it was funny. You know, it wasn't, wasn't something I was seeking out. It was something I just found, you know. You know how it is. You've made, I, you, we've both made thousands of pots. Or, you know, I made hundreds of thousands of mugs. I, I couldn't tell you how many, but it's not always what you intended but what you what you arrive at you know and just seeing the value in what you have in front of you there was this great quote that you said in an article that was for ceramics monthly that was about let's see i think that was 2020 and i'm going to read your words back to you which i know can always be a little <laughs> uneasy but you said making pots is easy the hard part is finding your voice and creating pots that are unique and truly express who you are and then later on down on that paragraph, you say, eventually, if you work hard at it for long enough, you'll find your audience and then you're on your way. Yeah. The first question is like, what, at, at what part in your career did you feel like you found your voice? And then how did you find people that liked your voice? Well, I mean, we just talked about, you know, how my work developed and it started out as just me doing copies of like, Chinese pottery, you know, rabbits and deer and that. And I just thought they were so humorous and, and, um, you know, situ wear, Chinese situ wear, by the Korean pots, Korean full of pottery. Um, their work seemed so humorous to me, even though I didn't know what they intended it to be. Um, but they're just like these funny cartoons, like the, you know, they're like cartoon fish. But, um, I, um, I saw Matt Metz jar that had this cityscape drawn. You know, it was like it was like scraffito with yellow slip, and it was just so. I just just spoke to me, and um, I think sometimes you need permission, or you, you know, I needed permission to extend myself above beyond what I was doing, and um, so then that's when I started incorporating my own drawings and i'd always been into drawing and doodling and i just realized oh these funny things that i do on a paper i can do on my pots and um i mean i think people immediately saw that i was like fresh and new and different and um you know it doesn't i mean my work doesn't have broad appeal but i do feel like i have a niche that really appreciates what i do and that's why i'm like a Somebody told me once that I was a cult band, you know, <laughs> I'm like a cult band and that's fine with me, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> so speaking of bands, um, I did want to know, like, what, what was the pop, <clears throat> pop culture that attracted you a as you developed your aesthetic? Because one thing I think about, like your work has a comic quality, but the the compositions aren't necessarily set up like comics. And it, it kind of made me think like, are you, is it poetry? Is it comics? Is it music? Like what, what, where do you see your aesthetic in other places? Well, I mean, uh, like the thing I love about, like I grew up listening to punk rock and like post-punk and that's my favorite music. And it's more, it's mostly about, um, it's not about technique and skill. It's about vibe. You know, it's about like the heart and the soul of what, of what you, of who you are. And that's what I always was trying to convey with my work. I mean, I, I think my work is so is autobiographical because that's, you know, that's who I am. It's like, my work is a chaotic and what I, why I, you know, some sometimes people say oh, your work is so beautiful. It's like my work's not beautiful, but <laughs> maybe there's maybe there's beauty in it. I don't know, but that's not my goal. You mentioned chaotic, and there's something about 
the way you fill surfaces. So like, let's say a jar, you know, like you'll have the vertical surface of a jar and you might have a character, or two characters that are on it, but then there's other visual elements that kind of fill in that space. And I can see it as music, you know, like I can see it yeah. as oh, yeah. drums or cymbals or something that's filling background space. So can you talk about like, once you get your figure on there, how, how are you thinking compositionally about what wraps around it? Well, man, I'm not, I'm, it's all intuitive to me. I don't, you know, I, I just start drawing and doodling, see where it goes, you know. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I definitely don't like to leave. I'm uncomfortable with empty spaces, you know. So yeah, I definitely like to fill the surface. I love this thing you do where you'll have like, let's say you got a, a jar that's like 10 inches tall, then you'll have a figure on the jar that's maybe six inches of the 10. So it's mostly fig fills up the space, but then you'll have like tons of dots, you know, like, like 60 dots of different colors around that figure. H how do you figure out the rhythm of the color? Cause it's not like you've got all blue and then green. It's more like red, yellow, like you're, you're really mixing warm and cool colors right on the surface of the pot. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just try and, you know, start with one color and then, you know, I'm thinking about like, I mean, I've never like studied color theory, but that, that I'm, and I'm not really even thinking about like what colors complement each other. I just, I know that I've got 15 jars of color of glaze and I'm going to use all 15. And, <laughs> you know, that's how I, that's how I organize it. You know, there's very little planning that goes into my work. You know, it's all chaos. It's all it's all a big mess, Ben. <laughs> but I like that. Let, let's think of it musically again. Like if there are, you know, twenty notes, you're you, you're going to use twenty notes. Like there, you're not leaving any note out. <laughs> yeah, why? Well, I, I don't discriminate. I love all notes. <laughs> <laughs> and the one thing that um somebody told me once, very smart, was always include an ugly color. Because that makes the the better color, you know, like the beautiful colors pop more. You know, it gives <laughs> a little balance. Do you have a go to ugly color? I do, but I won't say what it is. <laughs> I don't want to hurt his feelings. Yeah. <laughs> and no, it's probably like a it's probably like an olive green. You know, it's not an ugly color, but it's like totally different than everything else. You know. Yeah. There's this John Gill quote that he said he said a bunch about that. All colors go together. Some just have to work harder. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love that. And I think that I think that's true. It's like everything in proportion can make sense. Yeah. But I, I wanted to go back to some of the colors, sorry, some of the characters that recur. And there's fish. Like I can see the fish going back to the Korean pots and Chinese pots that you're talking about. And Mimbris is a big influence too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I can see that in the drawing style for sure. Although I have been accused of copying memories, but I was doing that long before I was even aware of what those pots, you know, it was like, I don't want to say it primitive because that's, you know, that that's not the correct term, but it's like, it's just sort of core to human experience, you know, like, and I think, it, I think it travels from one, you know, it, it exists in every culture. So I'm thinking of those those figures, but then I'm also thinking about some things that are extremely contemporary. So let's think about a robot. You know, like a robot. I mean, I guess in a way, it's kind of they're kind of '70s robots. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, they're they're not slick and futuristic. They're more like the Jetsons, but trippy kind of. <laughs> Jetsons are a big influence on me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. do you think about the meaning of the robot? Is in like this human something that humans build that approximates human life or is it literally just like visually robots are very cool and funny i think it's a visual yeah visually i don't there's nothing conceptual about it you know i'd say it's yeah it's just i think real like i think drawings of robots are funny <laughs> i always try and my my motto is always do the fun option you know mm -hmm. so so when I was looking through pots, there, there's a scale thing, you know, like mugs, like we all make mugs cause we gotta make a living, you know, like mugs are, are kind of the, 
universal bread and butter. Yep. But then there's some other things, like some big bowls that you make where the inside surface is a really nice surface to draw on. Um, and it, it feels like that's like just so totally different in terms of the perception of space, but, but you're using some of the same mechanisms. So for instance, on the big bowls, you'll do like repetitious marks around the edge that, that give it some rhythm. But do, do you think differently about like, let's contrast a mug, a jar and a bowl. How do you approach those, or do you approach those differently? Well, I think the, I think the, the mugs are just that's like that's just iconography, you know. That's like this. It's like I have this visual iconography that I've developed over the last twenty years. The bigger, the bigger, wider bowls, and sometimes the jars even give me a chance to make it. Like my work is never narrative, you know. But it it gives me an opportunity to pair up images that might let the viewer create their own story. Like one time, I did a, a jar that had a it had a cop, it had a telephone, and it had a chicken. And <laughs> somebody was like, "Call the cops, chicken," you know. So, well, like my my work is never narrative, but. It does include iconography that have meaning to you that could be completely different than to somebody else. And that's the opportunity I have with, with the bigger jars and the, I think with the bigger, you know, I made some big platters when I was at Archie Bray uh, last time. And um, I think I was also including some text. I'm not sure what my goal was for those, but I just wanted to make a lot of the text I include is a lot from their song lyrics, very obscure song lyrics, or yeah, just funny quotes. Or when you're thinking about text, it's it's very specific as to where a lot of the other characters, they're less. I mean, they're specifically you, but they're not. You can't quite tell exactly what they are. Like, is this thing a human? Is it a monster? Is it a, you know, like you can't quite figure that out. But text, text is what it is. So yeah, yeah. I don't know how, I don't know if this is the right question, but can text ever be a trap? You know, like it takes away possibilities as opposed absolutely. to creating more of it. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like if you're going to use text, you have to have a reason to use it. You know, I mean, my re the reason I use it is to call attention to like a lot, like a song or a, or a attitude or a, a, but I do feel like sometimes people use text because it's it can be a crutch you know so i do feel like you need to have a good you know a, a reason to use it yeah and i think with your work there is a logic like there's a design logic but in my mind it's it's almost dream logic you know like things can go together that wouldn't go together in nature in the moment you start bringing text into something i think it does tap into our logical Mind, sure. yeah. wanting to decode something, you yeah. Know? But but I wanted to think broadly about what what your pots communicate because I, I I noticed that like often you'll do some do things around themes of love or like there were some jars on your Etsy that were about peace, you know, like they're kind of like big ideas. So can you talk about that wanting to to communicate larger sort of emotional tones? I'm trying to spread happiness and joy and love. You know, I'm not, I'm not a very serious person, Ben. I don't know if you can <laughs> tell that. So I'm not, I just want to make people happy. You know, I don't want to do anything controversial. I don't want to, I want to write things that we can all identify with. And, you know, the thing that I, that I always find so rewarding is when people are attracted to my imagery because it reminds them of something funny or, so, you know, like a cartoon they used to like or a dog they used to have. You know, I get that all the time. Oh, you're, you know, this drawing reminds me of this dog I used to have. Or, you know, a lot of times people ask me to do a, a portrait of their dog and I can't, you know, I'm not going to do that. I, I can't do that. I don't have that skill set, you know. But, you know, I'll, I'll do a dog that hopefully reminds you of the feeling you had about it, a pet or a loved one or something that brought you joy. That's really what I want to do. Like 
I said, I'm not a very serious person. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to think about the emotions of color. Because yeah. there's, you know, like talking about wanting to make happy pots, somehow if you put red and yellow together, <laughs> if it's the right red and yellow, generally it, it does feel like happiness. And it's the same with like the hearts, you know, like sometimes you'll use heart, which uh, the symbol of the heart, you know, like the drawn heart can be a cliche, but the way you use them is like repeating them over and over and over again. So they the meaning is still there, but it kind of loses itself into just being like a mark making. And then the, the color is what is conveying the happiness of it. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, I love color. Color is life. You know, color is joy and happiness to me. And, um, I, I, I mean, I, I know some people just don't like color and that, uh, that's fine. I, I just don't, that's just not me. I love color. I will use it as much as I can. When I came to your place, this was probably like a year ago or so, I brought some students over and you told me this story about coming up with a matte glaze that's not, that's not really a glaze. It's a glaze. Yeah. <laughs> Can you explain how you got to the thinnest glaze possible, but still make the color underneath it react? Well, I just, I mean, talking about failure, I had a show once in Port Chester at the Clare Center. And uh, I had been firing soda pots my whole career through grad school, through my time at Archie Bray. And I got to my home studio and I had the show coming up and I didn't have, I, ne I needed to find a glaze I could fire in an electric kiln. So, so I dipped all my pots in this glaze and it was so shiny. And it just did not work for my for for what I was trying. What I re, what I figured out later was that if I diluted that glaze down to like one tenth of what it was, even even one twenty, you know, a very thin layer of that same glaze, it just has a nice matte finish, and um, it's almost unglazed, but there is a little bit. I I've tried to unglazed surfaces and they just don't have the same feeling so but yeah i just do that very diluted clear glaze and then there's a little bit of sanding that goes on after and i get the surface that i want yeah and it is such a good surface i mean i think the reason we got on that topic is that my students were like hey how do you do this <laughs> yeah i think there's other ways to do it too i mean i see people spraying um soda on their pots or um just um, spraying uh, or sleep or eight, just mix with water. There's other ways to do it, but yeah, or to have a soda kill. Yeah, totally. <laughs> when I was at Archie Bray, I used to fire, I was sharing a kill with Kenyon Hansen, and Kenyon would spray obscene amounts of soda into the kiln. <laughs> and it was, you know, he has this nice, just like luscious surfaces. But I would fire right after him, and I wouldn't add a drop of soda. It was just residual, and it was perfect. So oh. that's what I was trying to emulate, you know, just a little bit of soda. Oh, that totally makes sense. You're, so you're just getting residual from the atmosphere, and I would imagine that it was also changing slightly every time because you were firing it. Yeah, yeah. If I had a perfect world, I'd just share a soda again with Kenny Nansen. <laughs> I fired right after him. <laughs> so in terms of the the quality the color like all these things add up to something that like i said there's a logic to the design but it's unrefined and refined at the same time yeah. like it it's refined because you've worked on it for years and years and years but there are parts that could have more detail or you know something like that and it made me think about like the interview we were doing before this when we were talking with matt towers um, we were talking about the first time you guys went to the Archie Bray Foundation, and there were basically tons of good people there working with you. And this was early in your ceramic career. And I wondered, is, is there ever been a time in which you thought, I need to refine this? I'm trying to think of the right question. Sometimes people achieve beauty through refining, 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 making it more dense. But it feels like with you, you found the frequency that you want. 
and you refine it by making it more complicated, but you're not you're not fussing over the drawing more and more and more the better you've gotten down the line. So how did you figure that that frequency out? I want to say I just arrived at it through accident, you know, through trial and error. And, you know, like I say, my, my work is chaotic, but there's, you know, things can be unrefined, but they can be beautiful. You know, like I think about the situ or, or Aribe where or, uh, you know, Bun Chong is a Korean pots, folk pottery. I love folk art. You know, I love Bill Trailer or William Hawkins. And there were, I think their work is, I don't, I wouldn't say it's beautiful, but it's compelling and um, it's attractive. I love things that are raw and unrefined. You know, I've, I see too, I don't like, when I find I'm getting too refined, then I figure out a way to, subvert that refinement um yeah i mean there's this term subverting your own virtuosity you know i feel like i really i now i sort of do it unconsciously but it's never been something i've been driven by to refine my work it's the opposite is true and i'm, I'm i keep asking this question in different words because i think i'm in my head i'm trying to figure out how I do that. Cause I, I've always loved Ron Meyer's work. Like he's one of my, yeah, my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. And it's every part of the way he touches clay is pretty much opposite to me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I, I keep thinking like I'll tighten up and loosen up and tighten up and loosen up. But my loose is still 200% tighter than his tight. You know what I mean? So I'm interested in how we all come to, what feels natural to us. Cause eventually I just realized like, I'm not going to throw like Ron Myers. I might be able to teach myself how to use a brush like him, but the throwing is just not, that's just not my, my way of throwing. I mean, I just feel like you have, you are who you are. If there's anything I can teach or, you know, he'll hopefully get a, a student to arrive at is you have to be authentic to who you are. You can't, you know, you and you've been in schools where you see people trying to be Julia Galloway or trying to be, you know, Matt Metz or whoever. It's just be who you are. And if you do this long enough, like I said in that article, you know, stick at it, like find your vision, stick at it, and you will find your audience. Just be true, just be authentic to yourself and don't, you know, and you know when you're lying to yourself, you know. Like, you know, you can't throw like Ron Myers. So why, why try? That's, and it takes a while to get to that point. You know, I'm not going to be a 18th century Japanese Aribe artist. You know, I'm going to be the best Kurt Anderson I can be. I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about working through some injuries. Are you comfortable talking about your hands? Sure, yeah. Can you talk about what the the progressive injury was and then how you've been able to work through that. Okay. So that injury, but I have rheumatoid arthritis. What that means is that um, my immune system thinks that my soft tissue and my joints is a foreign entity and is killing it. I mean, it's been something I've had to deal with. I, one thing I do is I hire people to throw for me now. And then, you know, I can still throw like smaller things, but, I'll, I'll pay somebody to come in for an afternoon and throw 20 mugs. You know, it's worth it to me. It's worth it to them too. But yeah, I mean, that's just a reality I have to deal with. And I, I just find different ways to, you know, work with slabs or work with molds. Um, there's a lot of ways around it, but yeah. I, I was actually, I was talking to Ron Myers about a year ago and he was talking about some problems he was having with his hands. And he said this thing, he said, I can't throw very good, but my painting's getting much better. <laughs> That's yeah. And I do, I mean, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I do a lot more 2D work now than I used to. And uh, that's been, since I moved to North Carolina, that's been something that I've, that's sort of accidentally become a bigger part of my practice. It wasn't something I intended, but, um, you know, I started putting work out there and people liked it. And, and so I've been exploring that. Yeah, yeah, this is a good segue. Let, let's talk about the woodwork. The, their paintings on, well, not all of them, but 
first let's talk about the larger paintings on wood that go outside. They're like yard sign makes it sound not cool because they're yeah. super they're super cool, but they're they have the sense of being they're outdoor art. They are for the side of your house or in your yard somewhere. I mean, I just sort of started doing it gorilla style, just putting it up on. I mean, you know what it's like around there. There's lots of abandoned buildings and, you know, I saw a mobile home and I thought, oh, that thing could use like a big monster on it. So, so I just put one up one night and, and people loved it, you know, and I mean, some people loved it. Some people thought it was voodoo and, um, <laughs> and uh, called the sheriff on me, but, uh, oh, shit. but for the most part, I've got a really positive guy. I mean, I did it anonymously, but somebody called me out on social media and said, oh, that's Kurt. And uh, I never wanted it to happen, but but yeah, it's been great. You know, they're all over the place now. Sometimes they get stolen, which is very flattering. <laughs> um, and sometimes they get thrown in the middle of the road. The sheriff gets called. <laughs> well, what's funny about them is that you'll be driving around Pinland, like uh, up in the mountains there. And you'll just be going around a corner, and then all of a sudden, one of your monsters will be looking at you as you're driving. And, and it is fun. Like, a lot of times those roads, they're beautiful in their own way, those winding, curving roads, but they kind of all blend together. But now I mark those roads by where your pieces are. So there's almost like a map of characters up That's in the awesome. there. I love that, yeah. I do kind of have rules about it. Like, I think, um, I think like the like the, the the old barns that are falling apart i think they kind of are beautiful and they don't really need anything on them but when i see like these mobile homes and other stuff you know i think they need a little sprucing up <laughs> it's funny that people think that it's voodoo or something because the, the mountains of north carolina are such an interesting mix of people there are super conservative religious oftentimes fundamentalists. And then there is an art community and they kind of live in peace and harmony <laughs> until someone smashes one of your, your paintings. You know what I mean? It's, it's weird. I mean, it's better than like getting in a fight, but it, it is a weird intermixing of two cultures that maybe wouldn't naturally go together. Well, I mean, I think people now know, like now that I bought a house here and I'm like becoming a part of the community, like, uh, there was a Tow River Arts Council. Uh, there's a studio tour. Then there was one a couple weeks a couple weeks ago, and um, a lot of people came to my studio and wanted to meet the guy who did those monsters on the wall, you know, on buildings. And so I think at this point, they know it's just not voodoo. It's just something funny, and you know, it's not vandalism. Yeah, and it, and I think it's the way you show you care. You know, like, it's like you saying, like, I want this to be more beautiful. Yeah. Or I want, you know, I want you to get along your way to, to the grocery store. So the 2D work that you're doing that, that lives in frames, you know, like not the outdoor work, but the yeah. smaller work. Yeah. How do you approach that versus pots? Like what, what changes when it goes from the surface of a pot to a, a painting? That's a good question. I mean, if it's on a pot, I feel like. It's hard to explain. I mean, the thing with those duty things is that sometimes I'll cover, I'll paint over them and I'll redo them a dozen times. So you can't do that with a pot, you know? I mean, I, I don't want to call it refinement, but I'm, I'm a little more particular about with how they end up, you know? Like I will, I will, I will edit those a lot to, to get what, what I'm going for. Yeah, I don't know. I think there there's a sense of humor into them, and they're de I don't think they're beautiful by any means. But and I, I do like though that your sense of humor can live inside the home in that way. You know, like when when they're when they're on a pot, it's it's going to be linked to food in some way, you know, shape or form. Right. But when it's on a painting, it's obvious. Like this is it it, it reads as it it the joke reads as a joke. You know what I mean? Like visually, you get to the humor a little bit faster, right. I think. Right, right. Eventually, that joke's going to get old, you know? So you might as well have something nice hanging on your wall. That's just more than a joke, you know? 
Well, the, the thing I wanted to wrap up about is you settling in North Carolina because you've, you know, you've worked a lot of places. You worked at the Bray, you lived in New York, you've lived some other places that I, <laughs> I can't remember, yeah. but, but you know, you're settled in, in North Carolina now and you have a community like you even, you even share a studio, don't you? I don't anymore, but I did for, yeah, I did up until just a month ago. Okay. Yeah. So can you talk about choosing a community? I just love this place. You know, this like, you know, I was at the grocery store a few weeks ago or, you know, it can happen anytime and it'll be like, you know, Michael Klein talking to Stanley, May, you know, Stanley Anderson. And it's like, Oh my God, it's like a little Enzika here. You know, <laughs> it happens all the time. You know, like there's Cynthia Pringle and I don't know. It's just such a great supportive. It's so supportive and, it's a vibrant, there's glass artists, there's, you know, painters, weavers. There's just such a great mix of people and there's always something happening. There's always something to see. And that's like, even up, above and beyond, like Pedlin's amazing. You know, there's, there's like world-class artists giving lectures there regularly. So, and I love the climate here. It's like, a, you know, it's like, Summers aren't terrible. The winters are not terrible, but it does have four seasons, which I like. Yeah, I just really feel lucky to be here. I've always had dreams of uh, resettling down in that area around Asheville or up 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 towards Penland. It's it's so good. Yeah. Well, to wrap up, can you leave your Etsy site and then also your social media so people could get in touch if they want to? Yeah, my Etsy is just uh, Anderson Bottery. My Instagram is at Kurt Anderson Pottery. Well, thanks, man. It was good to talk to you. Yeah, Ben, I really appreciate it. And it was um, good talking to you, too. I'd like to thank Kurt for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to chat with him. Every time I look at his work, either pots or paintings, it does make me laugh. He has this ability to change scale and use color in a way that always gets me. So I really appreciate the joy he's bringing into the world these days. Also wanted to thank today's sponsors, Amico Brent, the Archie Bray Foundation, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in sponsoring an episode of this podcast or any of our shows on the Brickyard Network, you can get in touch through the website. That's Brickyard Network. Org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit BrickyardNetwork.org.